something very strange is happening. No, I'm not referring to Nuno Tavares getting frisky with his dog, Chelsea winning a game, or the fact that people still watch Thogden, though all of those probably ought to be investigated. I am talking, of course, about the fact that the England men's national football team is actually quite good. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on there a minute. I can already feel some of you having an acid reflux reaction to that statement deep in the pit of your stomach. But Alfie, they haven't won anything. They're useless. They're bottle jobs. Yet another deluded England fan just setting themselves up to fail. If you had any of those responses to me saying, and I quote, the England men's national football team is quite good, then that is what I'm going to start calling England derangement syndrome, and it is perhaps even more prevalent among supposed England fans than anyone else. Look, I get it. Sort of. I think I grew up in an era in which a lot of those criticisms could fairly be levelled at England, and at a lot of England fans. Growing up during the so-called Golden Generation era, it felt like going into several tournaments, at least from Euro 2004 to the 2010 World Cup, there was a heightened sense of expectation surrounding the England team, within England, that probably couldn't be justified. Make no mistake, the Euro 2004 squad and some of those around it were excellent, and England were probably closer to doing real damage at some of those tournaments than a lot of people realise. If you look particularly at the 2002 World Cup, where England only lost very narrowly against the 10 men of eventual winners Brazil, and Euro 2004, where the star of that tournament, Wayne Rooney's 27th minute injury, probably prevented England from beating the host nation Portugal within 90 minutes, and even then, they still only lost on penalties. Nonetheless, even on paper, there were other squads that were just as strong or stronger, and the sense not so much of hope or excitement, but of expectation, was probably always misplaced. And it manifested itself in ways that made England very unsympathetic from the perspective of outsiders. Sometimes fans, but particularly, I think, the media and certain pundits. If I wasn't born in England, and therefore an England fan, I probably would have developed the same sense of animosity towards the England team that I see play out in the comments on this channel, even from people who usually like me, around major tournaments or just whenever the topic of England crops up. In fact, I think a lot of England fans themselves share that hostility towards the England team and the narrative that surrounded the team during that era, particularly following the 2010 World Cup. The idea that most England fans thought that England were going to win Euro 2012, the 2014 World Cup, Euro 2016 or the 2018 World Cup, or that they had the best team at any of those tournaments, is just a myth. I mean, you might have been able to find five people in a country of 55 million who were off their face on ketamine at the time, but by and large, the opposite was true. I even made a video just before the 2018 World Cup titled something like England Aren't That Bad, in which I basically just said that I thought Gareth Southgate had changed the mood of the England squad, and even though it was the weakest England squad of my lifetime on paper, I wouldn't be at all surprised and actually expected them to make it through to the quarterfinals in Russia. To conclude, we should say we don't think England are going to win the World Cup. The quality just isn't there in key areas, particularly in the middle of the park. On the other hand though, there's no reason why they can't give a really good account of themselves and at least restore some pride in the English game for future tournaments as a young up and coming squad. Don't ask about the voice, or why I always used to refer to this channel as we, despite the fact that it's only ever been me, it was a long time ago alright? Following a group stage exit in 2014 and humiliation against Iceland in 2016 however, trying to rally any sense of optimism among England fans in 2018 was a bit like trying to demolish a castle armed only with a marshmallow. This was the general sentiment towards the England team at the time. Of course, England went on to reach the semi-finals of the 2018 World Cup, exceeding even my supposedly overinflated or deluded expectations, and that was followed by a final appearance at Euro 2020, where England only lost 3-1 on penalties after drawing one all with Italy over 120 minutes, and a quarter-final exit at the 2022 World Cup against eventual runners-up France in a game that would have gone to extra time had Harry Kane not uncharacteristically missed from 12 yards out, after England had more possession, more chances, more shots, more shots on target, and a higher XG than their opponents. 
Despite all of that, England far exceeding what anyone expected from their next three tournaments following Euro 2016, at a time when many England fans thought that England wouldn't even make it out of the group stage of the next World Cup, there is a sense in which the mood hasn't changed. The expectations have changed, internally at least, they are much higher now, but that sense of pessimism and it being fashionable to dunk on England or dismiss their prospects at the next major tournament still persists. Again, I understand some of the external animosity. Five minutes watching Rio Ferdinand's analysis of who he'd rather England face in the Euro 2020 final before they'd even made it through the semis against Denmark is enough to make anyone want to see England lose. It doesn't matter who goes through here if you're England, because I believe England beat both of these sides. I just feel that I don't know one can compete with us right now. The confidence we've got, people might say I'm getting carried away, I don't care. What I've seen, I feel England are the better team and the best team and they beat both of these teams. Stuff like that deserves ridicule, and I would join you in ridiculing it, but some of the criticism of England is a little confused. There is a certain irony, for example, about people who claim that England are useless or failures because they don't win major tournaments, even when they play well and get through to the quarters, the semis or the final, while simultaneously making the case that England fans are arrogant. Personally, I think the idea that anything other than winning a major tournament, which of course only one team out of 24, 32 or 48 can ever do, can only ever be deemed as an unmitigated failure and is deserving of zero credit is just about the most arrogant view of all. Yet lots of people, whether rivals or often England fans themselves, are capable of somehow juggling both of these views at once without an ounce of self-awareness. Anyway. All of that is just a very roundabout way of saying that if you're one of those people who suffers from an aneurysm anytime anyone says that England might not actually be that bad, you're not going to enjoy this video. The central thesis of which is that I think, for the first time in my lifetime, and actually for the first time probably since the 1940s, I think that on paper, England can perhaps lay claim to having the strongest squad in international football, and also for the first time in my lifetime, I think that it would at least be a reasonable opinion to view them as the favourites to win the next major tournament, or at least one of the two favourites tied with France. That's not necessarily because England are so brilliant, though I do think that Gareth Southgate currently has an excellent pool of players to pick from, but in large part, that's because the talent is so much more evenly distributed geographically now than it has been in previous generations, and there are far fewer super teams. I've discussed this in more detail in the past, in a video about how the global football landscape is shifting, but it's not nostalgic to think that the major football nations had more star power and better teams overall 20 years ago. It is just plainly true. A Euro 2004, Portugal had Carvalho, Costa, Figo, Deco and Ronaldo. Spain had Casillas, Puyol, Xabi Alonso, Xavi, Raul and Torres. France had Desai, Toram, Vieira, Makalele, Perez, Henri, Trezeguet and Zidane. Italy had Buffon, Cannavaro, Nesta, Gattuso, Pirlo, Del Piero, Vieri and Totti. Germany had Kahn, Lahm, Schweinsteiger, Closer, Balak and Podolski. And the Netherlands had Van der Sar, Stam, De Boer, Koku, Davids, Van der Vaart, Schneider, Overmars, Robben, Seedorf, Kleibert and Van Nistelrooy. I mean, Christ, when you put it like that, it's a crime that Dutch team never won anything. And most remarkably of all, they didn't even qualify for the 2002 World Cup. It's for that reason that the idea that England's supposed golden generation should have won a major tournament, rather than just being one of many very good teams likely to reach the latter stages, was always misplaced. As good as England were on paper at the time, and I could just as easily reel off the names of Gary Neville, Rio Ferdinand, Sol Campbell, Ashley Cole, Paul Scholes, Stephen Gerrard, Frank Lampard, David Beckham, Wayne Rooney and Michael Owen, at every tournament there were four or five teams that were just as good or even better than them. Brazil, likewise, had Kaká, Cafu, Dida, Robinho, Ronaldo, Roberto, Carlos, Gilberto, Silva, Lucio, Rivaldo, Ronaldinho, Janinho, and Adriano in their ranks at the time. Meanwhile, Argentina were blessed with the likes of Roberto Ayala, Javier Mascherano, Javier Zanetti, Hernan Crespo, Esteban Cambiasso, Carlos Tevez, and Juan Roman Raquelme, soon to be joined by a very young Lionel Messi. 
You can put any of those teams up side by side with those countries' current teams, and I won't go through them all because that would be a very time-consuming and tedious exercise, and the current squads and players wouldn't fare particularly well. In some cases, like Italy and the Netherlands, hardly any contemporary players would make the cut. Virgil van Dijk is probably the only Dutch player who would make a combined 11, possibly Frankie de Jong if you think that he could dislodge Seydorf, Davids or Koku, but that is a big if. And as for the Italians, central midfield is the only position where the current crop would even get a look in. I mean, just comparing strikers, for example, going from Del Piero, Vieri, and Totti to Scamacca, Raspadori, and Ken is a bit like going from a three Michelin star restaurant to a McDonald's drive through or relocating from Vienna to Milton Keynes. I'm sorry to the fine people of Milton Keynes, but yes, your town was the Moise Ken of that analogy. I make no apologies to McDonald's, I've got absolutely no time for soggy chips. Even the England team, if you were to make a combined 11 from England's Euro 2004 and likely Euro 2024 squads, there would probably be, well, uh, I've done it, I've made a combined 11, it was very difficult, but I think that it would probably look something like this, with five players from the current squad and six from 20 years ago. I'm not getting into the whole Gerard Lampard skulls thing, you can just go ahead and take your pick. Man for man, the England team was stronger on paper 20 years ago than it is now. Like virtually every other major football nation, it's just that the difference is much narrower with England and France, who I would argue are now the two best national teams in Europe, if not the world. Again, for now, I'm just talking about on paper. It didn't pass me by that Argentina won the World Cup or anything, but nor does it change the fact that Narwhal Molina and Nicolas Otamendi wouldn't make the England or France squads, let alone their starting 11s. And I know that even though I spent the entire introduction to this video going to extraordinary lengths, explaining why I don't think that has been the case at any previous time, at least not since the 1940s, when I think England most likely were the strongest team in the world, up until about 1948, when they lost the likes of Frank Swift, George Hardwick, Rach Carter and Tommy Lawton, there will still be those in the comments who say, same old England, getting overexcited, overrating their players, etc, etc. That is inevitable, but I think that it's an argument that is becoming increasingly unsustainable. For a start, it's basically undeniable at this stage that England are, at the bare minimum, one of the best teams in the world. They are the only team to have made the last eight of all three of their last major tournaments. They are ranked third in the FIFA World Rankings, trailing only 2022 World Cup finalists France and Argentina, and English players are increasingly beginning to star overseas. It used to be the case that English, and indeed British players more broadly, were very reluctant to move abroad, and that when they did, things often didn't turn out too well. Somewhat counterintuitively, however, as the Premier League has become more hegemonic and lucrative, opening up an ever wider gap financially at least over every other league in the world, more English players than ever before have begun playing abroad, and playing very well. Jude Bellingham and Harry Kane are perhaps the two most notable examples. I've taken a fair bit of flack a couple of times on this channel over the last few years for suggesting firstly that I thought there was very little to split Harry Kane and Robert Lewandowski, and secondly that I thought Kane was a better all-round centre-forward, and that if I had to pick one of them, I would probably lean towards Kane ahead of Lewandowski. I was even told to eat a bag of dicks just because of it. The argument that people always made was that Lewandowski simply scored more goals. However, in his first season playing in the Bundesliga, in a Bayern Munich team that looks likely to miss out on their first league title in 12 years, Kane is scoring goals at the same rate as Prime Lewandowski, he has scored 24 in 21 games in the league so far, while still being a far superior all-rounder who contributes a lot more than just goals alone. In terms of goals and assists, Lewandowski averaged a goal contribution once every 76 minutes during his time in Munich, but Kane has so far averaged one every 67 minutes. The point that I'm making, to be clear, isn't that Kane is better than Lewandowski, but that the idea that it is a ridiculous comparison, that Kane is nowhere near as good, or that England fans are wildly deluded for thinking that 
a man who has scored 62 goals from 89 caps, became England's all-time leading goal scorer in his 20s, and was on course to become the highest scorer of the Premier League era before moving to Bayern, might be one of the best strikers in the world, has been shown to be absurd. Likewise, Jude Bellingham, at the age of 20, and it is always worth reiterating his age because it is just so easy to forget, given the way in which he's playing and the things that he's achieving, has joined arguably the biggest club in world football, instantly become their star man, and has made La Liga and the Champions League look like the easiest competitions in the world. Bellingham is on course to comfortably outscore Cristiano Ronaldo in his first season at Real Madrid, despite the fact that Ronaldo arrived as a forward for a world record-breaking fee, was 24 years old, and had already won the Ballon d'Or. Unless someone says that he is better than Messi or Pelé, it's pretty tough to make the argument that anyone, let alone any England fans, are overrating Jude Bellingham. One could argue that the best player in the Bundesliga, La Liga, and the Premier League this season, three of Europe's top four leagues, are all English. Equally, two out of the four favourites to win the 2024 Ballon d'Or are English. No other nationality even has two players among the top ten. And between them, Kane and Bellingham have made a combined 64 goal contributions in 57 games so far this season, during their debut campaigns at two of the biggest clubs in the world, and again, one of them is only 20 years old. If any other country had Jude Bellingham emerge, probably the biggest talent in world football right now, the jealousy in England would be palpable. But he's ours. The jealousy is everyone else's this time around. Almost more importantly, on this front, are the English players impressing abroad who can't even get a look in for England. Fikayo Tomori, who made the Serie A team of the year as AC Milan won the Scudetto in the 2021-22 season, and has been a mainstay at centre-back at the San Siro for four seasons now, has only ever won five England caps at the age of 26, Fellow Milan star Ruben Loftus-Cheek, who has been outstanding in Italy this season, hasn't made an England squad in six years, now age 28. Chris Smalling hasn't won a cap in seven years, despite his renaissance at Roma, with whom he won the Europa Conference League, reached the Europa League final, and made UEFA's Conference League and Europa League Team of the Seasons in successive campaigns. Tammy Abraham barely got a sniff, despite starring alongside Smalling at Roma, and scoring 27 goals at all competitions in his debut campaign there. And Jadon Sancho, though his time at Manchester United couldn't really have gone much worse, both was and would appear to be once again one of the best players in the Bundesliga at Borussia Dortmund, with whom he is one of the most productive wide players in Europe, and previously made consecutive Bundesliga team of the season appearances, aged 19 and 20, has only ever been on the fringes of the England team, and seems extremely unlikely to fight his way back into contention before Euro 2024. Less high profile, but no less significant, you've also got Marcus Edwards starring for Sporting in the Portuguese Primera Liga, who is uncapped, aged 25, Angel Gomez, also uncapped, catching the eye at Lille in Ligue 1, and even someone like Eric Dyer, previously frozen out by Spurs and out of the England squad for the last couple of years, who has started the last three games since signing for Bayern Munich. It's harder to make the argument that English players are useless and or overrated when they are starring in other countries' top flights and still can't get a look in in the national team. That is just a cross-section of overseas players who can't get a look in when English footballers, it is worth re-emphasising, are still very poor travellers. Closer to home, there is perhaps no better illustration of the strength of Gareth Southgate's squad and, consequently, England's starting eleven than the fact that neither Phil Foden nor Trent Alexander-Arnold are likely to start for England at Euro 2024. Foden is arguably England's most gifted player and is now among the most productive players in Europe. Foden has made 20-plus goal contributions in every one of the last four seasons, including this one, still aged only 23, and so far this season, he has averaged either a goal or an assist once every 117 minutes, playing predominantly either on the right flank or in attacking midfield. Despite winning consecutive Premier League Young Player of the Season and PFA Young Player of the Year awards, and having already won five Premier League titles, racking up more than 250 appearances for the team that won a continental treble last season, it's always felt as though Foden has been on the periphery of the England team. 
There is a sense in which everyone thinks that he must start for England, he is simply too good not to, including Gareth Southgate himself, I suspect, but then you actually look at the team, and it is a case of who do you dislodge. Foden's best position, in my view at least, is in a nominally central role in attacking midfield, with ample license to roam. I think that he is probably a top five player in the world in that position. The problem is that the best number 10 on the planet, Jude Bellingham, also plays for England. And the nature of his start to life at Real Madrid in a more advanced role, along with his freakish talent and output, means that nobody, not even Phil Foden, is going to start ahead of him. Then you look at the right flank, Foden's next most effective position, and you find Bakayo Saka, a man who is even younger than Foden, but has so far made a much bigger impression on the international stage. At 22, Saka is already the star man for one of the best teams in Europe, at least in an attacking sense, and his output is even more impressive than Foden's. Last season, Saka made 26 goal contributions in 48 appearances, and that is a tally which he has already matched, with 13 goals and 13 assists, in only 31 games this season. Saka hasn't just won Arsenal's Player of the Year award twice before turning 23, he's also won England's Player of the Year award twice already, and deservedly so, routinely bringing his best form to the international stage, including the biggest stages of them all, in his only two major tournaments so far, Euro 2020 and the 2022 World Cup. In seven games for England in 2023, Saka made six goal contributions. It's almost unfathomable that Southgate would drop Saka, who he clearly loves, when he has been arguably England's best performer over the last few years, is in the form of his life for both England and Arsenal, and offers the perfect balance that Southgate wants on the right flank. That isn't another door slam shut for Foden then, which is why so many of his England appearances, several of them off the bench, have come on the left flank, where Marcus Rashford's starting berth has often been that little bit more precarious. I think Phil Foden is more gifted than both Marcus Rashford and even Bakayo Saka. The question is whether or not he is better than either of them for England on the left or right flanks. Every time that Gareth Southgate has started Foden in one of those wide roles in a front three, clearly desperate to somehow shoehorn him into the team, he has concluded, along with anyone who has watched most of those games in fairness, that England look more comfortable, more balanced, and more dangerous, especially on the counter-attack, with Rashford and Saka. You could argue, as many do, that it is Southgate's job to come up with solutions and find a way to fix that problem, but it's not as though there are any easy decisions. One of the most recurring themes of Southgate's management in recent years has been the constant critique of he's got to be starting X, Y, or Z, whether that be Foden, Grealish, or Madison, with a lot less attention paid to who should be dropped to make way for them. It feels as though some people would like to see England play a somewhat unorthodox 2-1-6-1 formation with six wingers or number 10s, or perhaps something a bit like this, with a great front four, Foden and Madison sitting in midfield, Saka and Grealish playing as wingbacks, and an ironclad centre-back pairing of Declan Rice and Trent Alexander. Alexander Arnold. Speaking of Alexander Arnold, he is the other player, along with Foden, who it just feels instinctively like England have to find a place for. The most productive, creative, and arguably gifted fullback in world football for the last five or maybe even six years, still aged only 25, Alexander Arnold has made more than 100 goal contributions in over 300 games for Liverpool from right back. Alexander Arnold already has the most assists of any defender during the Premier League era. He has made over 300 appearances in all competitions in a Liverpool team that has consistently been among the best in Europe since he broke into the team, winning a Premier League title, the FA Cup, the League Cup and the Champions League, having also been losing Champions League finalists twice, as well as, on an individual basis, having thrice made the PFA Team of the Year, twice making the Champions League Team of the Year, and once having made Thief Pro's World Eleven. For any other national team on the planet, I am convinced that Alexander-Arnold would be one of the first names on the team sheet and would already have won in excess of 50 caps. For England, Alexander-Arnold has routinely made the squad, but he's never come close to nailing down a starting berth. 
Trent has made a grand total of two appearances for England at major tournaments, both coming in dead rubbers, for want of a better word, in the final World Cup group game in 2018 and again in 2022 against Belgium and Wales. Meanwhile, he missed Euro 2020 for injury, but would have been unlikely to play more than once there as well. I genuinely don't think that there is another national team that Phil Foden and Trent Alexander-Arnold don't just start games for, but are among their star men, and, at least in Foden's case, potentially have a team built around them. Even France, who are so formidable and have even stronger depth than England, I think Foden starts ahead of Kingsley Coman, quite comfortably in fact, and the only question mark with Alexander-Arnold would be the fact that Didier Deschamps likes defensive fullbacks, often choosing to play centre-backs there instead, a bit like Tony Pulis, and Trent is a million miles from that. He has made it work with Teo Hernandez at left-back though, who is probably Europe's next most productive and offensive fullback after Trent, and I suspect that he would do the same with Alexander-Arnold, especially now that he has Aurelien Chouameni and Eduardo Camavinga, offering fantastic protection for France's defence in midfield. You could maybe make a case that Foden would face stiff competition in the Brazil team, when everyone's fit, and they can name a front three of Rodrigo, Neymar and Vinicius in behind a centre forward. But I still think that Foden gets in there, even if that is in place of Gabriel Jesus or Richarlison, and means either him or someone else plays as a false nine. The England team at Euro 2024 will probably look like this. This is my prediction, by the way, not my own preferred starting 11, which leaves no room not just for Phil Foden or Trent Alexander-Arnold, but also Jack Grealish, a £100 million footballer, the seventh most expensive signing of all time, who made 50 appearances as an integral part of the treble-winning best team in the world last season, Rhys James, who is one of the best fullbacks in the world when fit. I know, it is a big when. Kieran Trippier, who has 10 assists from 22 Premier League appearances this season, and was sought after by Bayern in January. Benjamin White, who plays every game for one of the best teams in Europe right now, but isn't even in contention for the England squad, it seems, let alone the starting 11. And James Madison, who is the star man for Spurs, who are currently fourth in the Premier League, along with Youngman Son, and has made 10 goal contributions in 14 appearances this season, yet it is quite frankly unimaginable that he will make England's 11 at the Euros, and feasible that he might not even make the squad. Centre-back is often cited as being a problem position for England, but John Stones is as good as anyone in world football right now, Southgate loves Maguire, who has been excellent for England and is now back starting for Manchester United, Fakayo Tomori is a star man at AC Milan, and Lewis Dunk, Mark Gay, Joe Gomez, Adam Webster, Tyrone Mings, Esri Konza, Levi Colville, Ben Mee, James Tarkovsky, and Max Kilman are all good to excellent centre-backs in what is now the best league in the world. England have arguably the second best defensive midfielder and the best attacking midfielder in world football so far this season in Jude Bellingham and Declan Rice, and while there isn't an obvious candidate to be the third man in the England midfield, it's not as though there's a lack of options. Jordan Henderson, Calvin Phillips, James Ward-Prowse, Ruben Loftus-Cheek, Curtis Jones, Connor Gallagher, Ross Barkley, Sean Longstaff, Lewis Miley, Kobe Mino, and though he is out in the cold and out injured right now, you'd have to imagine that Mason Mount will be back in contention at some stage at least. That is 11 players that I just mentioned. Only one will most likely make England's starting 11, and only two, or at the very most three, are likely to make the squad. Further forward, I've already mentioned Foden, Grealish and Madison, but you've also got the likes of Raheem Sterling, who has won 82 caps, age 29, and was arguably not just England, but the tournament standout player at Euro 2020, Jared Bowen, Eberet Chiesa, Solly March, Anthony Gordon, Harvey Barnes, Noddy Madueke, Dwight McNeil, Cole Palmer, and Jadon Sancho. Again, none of them will make the 11, and probably only one will make the squad. Up front, obviously Kane starts, but then there is intense competition for one or at most two other centre-forward slots in the England squad, with Ollie Watkins, Ivan Toney, Callum Wilson, Dominic Calvert-Lewin, and the informed Dominic Solanke all vying for selection. Solanke is the third highest scorer in the Premier League this season, behind only Erling Haaland and Mohamed Salah, yet it seems improbable that he will even make the squad. 
Only Erling Haaland and Harry Kane outscored Ivan Tony last season, yet it's easy to imagine a world in which he doesn't make the squad, or at least fails to get on the pitch of the Euros. At the 2014 World Cup, Ricky Lambert and Danny Welbeck made the England squad off the back of seasons in which they scored 13 and 9 Premier League goals. Solanke has scored 13 already this season and has only ever won one cap seven years ago. It is remarkable in how short of a time England have gone from anyone getting regular minutes in any Premier League team was in with a shout of getting a call up, to players starring throughout Europe's top five leagues, most notably the Premier League, not even getting a sniff, and there is few signs of it letting up anytime soon. England just won the under-21 Euros, with a team starring the likes of Levi Colville, Taylor Harwood Bellis, Curtis Jones, Morgan Gibbs-White, Angel Gomez, Cole Palmer, Anthony Gordon, Noni Madueke, Cameron Archer, Harvey Elliott, and Tommy Doyle. Since then, the under-21s have further been strengthened by the likes of Tino Livramento, Hayden Hackney, Rico Lewis, Tyler Morton, Liam Delap, Jaden Philogene, and Jonathan Rowe, most of whom actually play in the Championship, as does Jack Clark, who can consider himself somewhat unfortunate in my view, never to have made an appearance for the under-21s. All are capable of becoming not just full England internationals, but very good internationals at that. All of this strength in depth, and the fact that, for the first time in my life at least, and as far as I'm aware for the first time since at least the 1970 World Cup, England will go into the next major tournament as favourites with the bookies, or at least joint favourites with France, obviously adds a lot of pressure. I think Gareth Southgate has received a lot of undue criticism at times, but I think Euro 2024 is the first tournament where it's probably fair to say that if England don't win, or at least if they lose to anyone other than France, it is probably reasonable to deem that a failure. That is a challenge, of course, because routinely, and indeed typically, the best team on paper doesn't win the Euros. France undoubtedly had the strongest squad at Euro 2020, yet they went out in the round of 16 against Switzerland, as Italy ultimately triumphed. France and Germany were the favourites and had the strongest squads at Euro 2016, but it was Portugal, who only won one game inside 90 minutes and finished third in their group, who reigned supreme in unusual circumstances. The expanded Euros format since 2016, which gives the top teams a relatively easy route through to the round of 16, means that teams effectively only have to win four games to be crowned as the champions of Europe. In a game of such fine margins, that means that just having the best or one of the best squads or starting 11 simply won't suffice. I make that point partly because it is true and important, but partly because I know that when England inevitably go out in the quarterfinals of Euro 2024, I'll get loads of people sending me this video. So, just to be clear, I'm not saying that England are going to win anything. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. I'm just saying that England are now, without a doubt, one of the best teams in the world, and I find it a little bit odd that lots of people, including England fans, refuse to acknowledge that fact, but at the same time consider it a huge failure if they don't win everything. Never before in my lifetime, or the lifetime of probably anyone watching this, have England had such a strong team, squad, and depth relative to world football's other top-ranked national teams. Alright, you can all go and dunk on me in the comments now. Typical England fan, deluded, overrated, eat a bag of dicks, whatever you like. I should say though, you can go back and watch my What to Expect from England videos at the 2018 World Cup, Euro 2020, and the 2022 World Cup, where I predicted quarterfinal exits on all three occasions and was still accused of being deluded. England, of course, reached the semis, the final, and the quarterfinals of those three tournaments, so, if anything, when it comes to England, I have a track record of pessimism and of underrating them. I will ruin all of that now, though, by stating that, at this stage, if Harry Kane and Jude Bellingham are fully fit, England do have a really good chance in Germany, and I would probably make them either favourites or joint favourites, just like the bookies. There is still a much higher chance that England won't win, of course, because there are 23 other countries, but out of the 24, I think that they have as good a chance as anyone, and I've never thought that about England heading into a major tournament before in my life. Anyway, I am ready for the abuse. I actually relish it, so just know that you're only satiating my lust for being denigrated if you fall into the trap. 
Thank you all very much, as ever, for listening to my inane ramblings. I must admit this video felt a little bit more chaotic than usual at times, but I just think it's notable the depth that England have at this moment in time, and the unusual narrative that surrounds the national team, and I wanted to talk about it. So, yeah, that's what I did. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. I think I can predict a few of them. Uh, as always, make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on. Not just for this channel, but also my second channel, Alfie Potts Harmer. And you should be able to find both of those about to appear on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might enjoy watching after this one. You can also find me at, uh, on Twitter, Instagram, or threads via the username at HITC7s on all three. And all of those links, plus a whole lot more, should be down in the video description below. Cheers.